Uh, hello, everyone. My uh, phrase, as always. So I'm Mike from Projector Design School, and today we will meet with beautiful and clever Natasha Yan again. Why I'm saying again? Because some of you know that previous time was has uh, had really bad connection on both sides. That's why. Thank you, Natasha, for this opportunity, for one more chance to talk to you uh, and the questions that you want to ask. And yeah, and uh, sorry, I really want, I apologize to, to all of the people who are watching us now and had this, uh, was watching us previously. Sorry for that. So today we will jump uh, to our conversation and very soon. I just want to say that we will have the small scenario which we will follow and ask the questions by this scenario. But also you are really welcome to text your questions or opinions or everything what you want without any rude words, but you won't do that. So you are welcome to text to our live chat and I will read the most relevant or maybe all, you know, there won't be a lot of them, questions and Natasha will answer them if, yeah, if they will be good enough. So welcome back and thank you, Natasha, for getting back to our, our audience. How is your mood? Thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone, for uh, for having me. It's good to see you again. Cool. <laughs> again, I really I think that it will be my motto talking to you every time when I will text you back. So I will text again, again because <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much for getting back. And I want to ask, let's start with the projects. Like what are you, what, what are you working on now? Uh, well, you know, as you know, um, we, we are, you know, really multidisciplinary, multi um, project uh, practice. And uh, currently um, we have been working on the branding um, for a new, um, for a photonic, computing uh, company based in uh, Boston. So the, um, the firm is founded by two MIT um, PhDs from the computing um, department. And they, um, they're doing something really amazing. Um, they figured out how to, how to make photonic computing. And I know that this term may be you know, really new to, um, to all of us, right? Like what is photonic computing? Um, they, it's, a, it's a really difficult sort of, you know, technology and they um, have figured out how to make it work. And um, it's not a kind of day-to-day -day personal computer uh, that we use here. The computers that they create are for um, data centers. They are really powerful. They, um, they can process, you know, um, massive amount of um, data, but um, keeping it really, you know, cool temperature wise. And also it consumes a lot less energy and it's a lot smaller. So just from an environment um, point of view, it's just a much better um, paradigm, you know, um, for, for, for computing. So we've been working with them um, and the company is still in the, um, in the kind of startup um, mode. So uh, we're very lucky to be working uh, with the founders um, directly, you know, um, so, you know, the communication has been really great. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. Cool. Thank you. It's so interesting to, I guess, I never worked with such great clients, but I guess that it's very interesting. And I want to jump to the question because you mentioned that it's quite new, even for you. And I'm sure that like, if we're talking about this type of computers or such clients, and how does your process of work look like? Because uh, especially the uh, research phase, how do you jump to the project? What is the process? Mm -hmm. Especially with such clients when you don't know anything about this even like domain zone. Yeah, well, you know, um, this project is very unique in that, you know, um, it, is so, it is so new, right? Um, it's such a big paradigm shift. So. We don't have, we didn't have any um, existing knowledge to, to, to sort of work with, you know, because typically when you have um, a project, you have some sort of existing knowledge and existing understanding about what it is. You know, for example, if it's, you know, an app, right, whatever that app is, you know, be social media, 
be, you know, um, delivery app, you know, you know what it is. When it's a, you know, consumer product, you know what it is. But this project was really, really new in that because nothing like this existed before. So what we first did again is to um, look at what else is actually in the market, okay? Be startups or be more established um, firms, companies, they're doing related um, technology, maybe not the same, but related to understand, first of all, what they, what they do and how they talk about themselves, how they, take a, how they talk about their technology and what they look like. So when we do research, you know, we don't necessarily have to understand, you know, the nitty gritty of everything. You know, if you ask me, you know, how, like, you know, how, how, how does photonic computing really work, right? My answer is I still don't know. <laughs> but the thing is that I don't need to know how, how it works. I just need to know the big picture. What makes it different, right? You know, and what does it offer? that is very different from anything else. So we look at, you know, existing models out there from the language point of view and from the visual um, design point of view. And these two parts are always, you know, the foundational, um, to, foundational parts to our, to our research. And by doing that, you know, you would, you would come out with some sort of um, observation you know and your own analysis and that 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 is a really most important thing because you know you take that analysis or understanding into you know this specific client right cool thank you it's so interesting and excited i'm sure that you you have a lot of joy during this project i do yeah i i think that okay. you know, uh, the relationship uh, you know uh, is different too. Yeah. you have i guess that you have Sorry, you're cutting up a little bit. Can you say your question again? Hey, Mike, I think you froze. Yeah, yeah, it's some kind of joke from my internet provider. So it jumped a bit. So yeah, let's get back to your clients because you had plenty of them. And could you tell us more about your maybe top three favorite clients or projects which you had before? You know, it's very hard. And why they are favorite? You know, it's very hard to rank um, clients by, 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 you know, favorability, right? You know, which ones are my favorites, um, which ones are my least uh, favorites, you know, but I can tell you that um, I value, I mean, I value every relationship because, you know, design is design, but design cannot be done um, and design cannot be done well without a real, you know, a, a real sincere genuine relationship between peoples right and um it's hard to actually build a genuine relationship in the sort of client and service provider construct so what i'm saying is that you know if if there's this sort of very clear that oh these are the clients and we're here to serve them right that that's a power structure and that is inherent in every project but you can't build a real relationship out of that. So, you know, the projects and the clients that, you know, I personally, you know, um, have deeper connections to are those that we figured out how to transcend that client service provider relationship. That is that we work together on this together, right? And they can, you know, they can email me anytime. They can text me anytime with any questions. They don't necessarily have to go through um, a project manager, and you know that right now they're they're project managers, right? And they're they're really important um, to 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 the project flow, right? To every project, but I value those relationships where the clients feel comfortable contacting me directly with anything. Yeah, and those are the projects that I think you know are 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 the most um, successful. Cool. I've got the additional question because of your words. What is the edge of relationships between the client and the friend? Where do you, because as I understand that it's quite tough to work with the friends when the, the client, they uh, like he or she converts to the friend. So where's the edge which you keep? 
Yeah, you know, um, I think that friendship, you know, has to, I mean, friendship needs to based on, you know, a, a, some sort of, you know, mutual uh, respect, right? And mutual admiration for, yeah, for, for each other, right? So when that is there in the relationship, then any disagreements can be discussed and, you know, be agreed upon. But if there isn't that sort of mutual admiration, right? I admire what you do and you admire what I do. That, that things get really hard. And then you go back to a kind of power relationship, right? Like, hey, I'm the one paying you money. You should do what I say, right? And that's not healthy. But then if there's mutual respect, you know, hey, you're the expert. Okay, I'll listen to you this time. Um, then that's a really healthy relationship, yeah. Cool, thank you. Um, we are the school, that's why we have a lot of courses uh, dedicated to visual communication design. And it's quite important, I'm sure that maybe a few of our teachers even watch us, or maybe teachers of our other schools. And you have your own team, and I'm sure that you uh, also was teaching somewhere someday. So yeah. what are the main skills which the designer should have and how leads uh, should teach uh, or behave uh, during the uh, relationship with the younger professionals in the like team members? Well, you know, there are a couple of things to, uh, to this question, you know, um, and I, I, I get asked this question a lot about what skill sets should, you know, uh, you know a, a young designer or should, a, you know, design students have in order to enter the, the profession successfully, right? I, 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 I'm asked that question a lot, but I don't look at things from a skill set point of view at all, at all. Why? Because skill sets are highly replaceable, meaning that if you can actually program HTML, so can I. What are we competing on? You know what I mean? If you can actually design, you know, a packaging, if you can design a logo, so can I. If you can use Photoshop, so can I. These are skill sets. Yeah, what are we competing on? Skill sets are highly replaceable and skills are very easy to learn if you just put time and effort in it. Yeah, like anyone can learn how to do Cinema 4D. So skill sets don't create talent. So figuring out what are you talented at is more important than say, what skill sets do I have? Because you have to be talented at something in order to rise to the top, right? In order to actually have a voice in what you do, right? Otherwise you're just in the middle and bottom layer doing the sort of production kind of work and that's skill sets, yeah. But talent is very hard to build. So finding what you're talented at and typically what you're talented at is always what you're interested at mm -hmm. meaning that you cannot actually put put real you know thought and effort and passion into something that you're not interested at right and our interests are always very defined by who we are individually yeah so follow your interest build your talent and your skill sets are the basic things you can learn in school. YouTube has videos, right? You know, do that, right? But figuring out that talent is really important. Cool, thank you. I guess that we can go so deep in this issue because recently I was watching Netflix and there is the new episode about New York. Um, I, I'm really bad with the name names, but pretend it's the city, the name of this episode. And uh, the main character of this, uh, of this uh, series she said like uh, everything you could buy or like learn to do, but talent is the main issue which you should follow because it's, uh, it's that thing which defines you as the personality. That is really cool. Maybe you can give some tips how to find the talent because yeah, you already said that it's about that thing which you are interested in. But maybe it's something else. Maybe you can give some tips because I'm sure that there are a lot of people who don't know what is their talent or they are not sure that this particular stuff is it's their talent. Well, first of all, I think it's finding your own, 
your own interests. You know, can be a singular thing, can be a variety of interests, right? And that is something that's not hard to do because when you hate something, you know that that's not your interest, right? So you can start out by, you know, uh, removing things that you're not, that you hate, you don't like. And then what's left is likely, probably, what you're good at or what, you, what, you, what you're more interested in, right? Starting out with that. And then you have to just put hours and hours and hours and hours of practice into it. That is no different from say training to become the best athlete in the world, mm -hmm. right? For example, Michael Jordan, right? How did he become Michael Jordan? If you ask him, hey, what are your you know, top three skills? He wouldn't know because he lives with it. He lives with, with it's all internalized. He can't even break down, you know, oh, I have this skill. I'm good at shooting hoops. You know, I, I'm good at jumping high. He doesn't even know. And that's what, if you look at, you know, the best artists, you know, performers, athletes in the world, they're all like that. And design in my mind is no different. Yeah. Cool, thank you so much. Uh, oh yeah, so uh, the girl Marina uh, mentioned that it's Fran Lebovitz, the girl, of, uh, like the woman, she's comedian, which I mentioned, which to uh, told about the talent. Thank you so much, okay. Marina. Yeah. Um, also, um, uh, I want to get back to the skills because you said the skills as only hard skills. But what about soft skills? What should be the skill set uh, if we are talking about soft skills, about, for example, presentation or I don't know, uh, what should be the skill set which will define you as a better designer or it doesn't influence? Yeah, I think, you know, um, soft skills are very hard to outline because, you know, it's it, it comes down to First of all, I think just being um, being um, smart about things, right? You know, and having having some sort of common sense. You know, <laughs> and common sense is very hard to, to 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 outline, right? What is common sense, right? You know, um, but I think that being being able to develop the skill to actually detect, first of all, people's moods is very important. What kind of mood are they in? Because once you kind of you, you kind of kind of detect that you know people's sort of mood, how 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 they may be feeling at that time, you know how to better respond to that, right? If somebody is already you know in a kind of in a kind of you know bad mood when you start out your presentation, right? You you will probably have to figure out okay, how am I going to go through this presentation as quickly? as possible and as, as entertaining as possible. Because if the person is already in a bad mood, how do I engage him or her, right? That's what I mean by a kind of detecting skill. Second, second skill is listening. Because I mean, we all listen, but we don't. <laughs> <laughs> because when clients give, you know, say when you're in a presentation, they give you feedback, right? Their feedback is oftentimes a, just a long list of, oh, I like this, that bothers me. I'm, I'm not into this, I'm not into that. I don't know about this, I don't know about that. There isn't a conclusion on anything, right? So you have to actually develop a skill to lessen, at a, you know, very hard at the same time, figuring out how do you actually walk away with a summary of agreement because if you walk away with a bunch of page one, he likes this, page two, he likes that, page three, she doesn't like that, you're not gonna have, this is what we're going to do. First of all, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that, and we're gonna do that, and we're gonna look at all these things together in this way. Do you agree with this? Yes, I do. Great, we'll see you next week, right? That is a, that is a lessening and summarizing skill that I find um, most young designers uh, are not really aware of it. They're not aware of it, but I think it's something that you have to actually be so hyper aware of all the time. Yeah. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, now I read a lot of books about Stoicism, like ancient Greek philosophy, and they, it's one of the main um, attributes of this philosophy that you need to listen to other people. And silence is much more uh, treasurable than just than, than all the treasures in the world. You need to listen, you need to hear, and you need to uh, understand what should you do with that. Because clever people, they listen a lot. That's why I totally agree with you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And also, I want to add to this and jump with this phrase to the next question about curiosity. What do you think about curiosity? And also, because I remember when you, I think that it was in the interview for Projector Design School after you came to Kiev and after you left, I guess that it was one part. I was so excited to read this that the good designer should watch around, see everything, to be curious about everything. Uh, how, do you, how do you find all of your ideas? Where do you look? What is the process? What are the exercises which help uh, you to develop your curiosity? Maybe you have some tips. Well, I, I definitely have my own um, interest areas, right? Basically things that, that I'm interested in, that I'm looking at all the time without, with or without a project, you know, I'm just looking at those things I like all the time, right? And I, we, we all have those, you know, for example, for me, um, it's art and fashion, okay? I look at these two things all the time, you know, I have websites, apps that I'm looking at these, but for me, a really big um, school uh, for me is actually my projects because every time we get a new project is really a window an opportunity into something new absolutely into something that you never thought about before that you have no idea about for example photonic computing right um, I don't know what that is and I had no idea that currently our computer um, paradigm is still electrons <laughs> electrons is zero and one right mm -hmm. right and then there's this whole thing called photonic it's light okay so that's something that i learned right but then you know other projects uh to sort of push me into different kind of research and different learning you know for example autonomous you know car right mm -hmm. so uh we uh, just to give you a quick example i, I i'm not you know um a kind of uh you know I'm not interested in vehicles. I'm not interested in cars. I'm not interested in airplanes, that kind of thing, okay? But we were working with a venture capital um, firm and they invested year, back in the day an autonomous uh, vehicle, a, a tom autonomous car brand called Cruise. So Cruise was their investment. Cruise is, you know, autonomous driving. Cruise got bought, acquired by General Motors. So General Motors, you know, big American car company, right? And every car company is putting all their effort on, first of all, um, green vehicles as well as autonomous driving. So GM bought Cruise. So Cruise became like a, like a baby brand within um, General Motors. And yesterday I saw in the news that Microsoft invested two billions into Cruise, right? Microsoft, okay, tech company, right? Autonomous vehicle technology, safety, security, and all that makes total sense, right? So I emailed um, this news item to you know my designers who worked on you know that venture capital project, and then um, one of them replied. He said. Two billion, like as if he's really surprised. I mean, two billion, sure, it's 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 insane amount of money. But when it comes to car manufacturing, particularly autonomous car, two billion is nothing, right? You see what I mean, right? Mm -hmm. But I know two billion is nothing for autonomous car because I read a lot of articles about autonomous vehicles, you know, I listened to Elon Musk's interview and he talked about how hard it is to actually do a car company, right? So that knowledge base is what I built just from a related project. And that's not even like rebranding, you know, this autonomous car brand. So that is curiosity. So curiosity broadens your worldview 
And once your worldview is broadened, everything that you do, you know that is related to the world. So it's not like, oh, this is just a project. This is a job and I have nothing to do with it, right? I check in at nine o'clock, I check out at seven o'clock, right? I, I produce, design, here you go, here's a font, right? I have nothing to do with it. So I'm talking about a kind of attitude, yeah. And I see myself very, very much involved in the operation of the world because ultimately our work is going to live in the world and you have to just, you know, constantly look around, yeah. Cool, thank you so much, it's so interesting. And uh, the next question will be uh, related to this as well. So I will start. So the question is, um, you work with different companies. For example, you mentioned this venture company or this crazy computer company. How, and it's quite tough to let these brands, before that you work with Waze, which is well known and a lot of people know about your project. And I have about this project as well, a lot of questions, but in general, um, how do you, maybe you have some tips again, or how does it work to let uh, some crazy, ununderstandable company speak for, with a human language? Because as I understand that it's your job to make it speak with a human language, with a user-friendly language, because no one know about these crazy computers and you let the brand speak to let people understand. How do you do that? Uh, that, you know, that, that is a, that is a sort of, you know, language uh, kind of, you know, work, ver verbal language kind of work, you know, and there, there are no tips to it. Um, we have to, first of all, you know, understand, okay, what is this, what is this brand doing, right? How is that different? Is it different at all? I'm telling you, like a lot of things are actually not that different, which makes our job harder. Much harder. If they're not that different. It's very hard to, <laughs> to generate something that is honest and that is creative and that is also different, right? But I'm talking about, you know, luckily we work with brands who I think are all have, they, they all have very clear, you know, difference with other competitors. It's coming up with a big idea, right? You know, and the idea is a creative idea that is a little bit similar to say, like, you know, when you're um, say in the advertising um, industry, when they do a campaign, they need to have a big idea, right? And that idea then translates to um, different, you know, expressions, you know, be a commercial, you know, be, be a poster, be a whatever, right? So that finding that big idea is always, you know, really, really central. Um, for example, you know, like back in the day, you know, Nike, uh, you know, came up with uh, Wyden and Kennedy, the advertising firm that came up, you know, um, just do it, right, slogan um, for Nike. And that was an idea, right? That idea then, it wasn't intended as a slogan, um, but it was, it, it was so popular, right, that it, became um, eventually the slogan uh, for Nike. But, you know, just do it, that itself is a really, really strong idea that, you know, anyone um, can be an athlete, right? All it takes is just to get up your chair, go out, just do it, right? That was a very clear idea to me. So when it comes to language um, positioning ideas, it's very similar to that too. But we never kind of present anything as a slogan slogan is a totally different um, process. You have to look at ch um, trademark. You have to look at, you know, um, what is the advertising concept with it? And we don't do advertising. So uh, we always present our positioning ideas as an idea. And that's typically, a, you know, a sentence, a statement. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um... I'm sure that even such legendary people like you, even you are looking for some inspiration and you are in this field for a long, long time. But still, could you, could you name one or few of them, the best visual communication campaigns which you love through all the times? Not, not only yours, but maybe somewhere, yeah, so created by someone else, which inspired you. I, you know, um, 
I don't keep a library of that kind of thing in my head, but um, I have to say some of the um, some of the Apple um, pieces from the past are still incredibly um, original and striking um, for me. You know, for example, um, you know, the 1984 um, commercial, right? And that, you know, if you like now we're looking at it, you know, 30 years later, right? It still um, strikes as something that is so so daring, you know, really original, and that still feels original today, right? And also, you know, when Apple um, introduced those bright colored um, computers, right? And um, the language was really witty. It was very, always very, very punchy, very short, you know, combined with these really gorgeous, um, you know, photos of the, of the product that also felt really, really new. It felt like a really, it felt like a breakup from the past, you know. Um, I think Apple has several of those, you know, major breakups from conventions, you know, in their in their um, in their communication history. For example, one of the other example is that when they first one of their first um, iPhone commercials um, didn't talk about phones at all. It was just a collage of um, movies where people are talking on phone, right? So that is really about communication. That I thought was really brilliant um, as well. And their you know um, think campaign, right? Um, that I thought was really, really original too, yeah. Cool, thank you. And one more, just one small question about Balenciaga. What do you think? Because a lot of young people, they follow the, they think that Balenciaga creative uh, group, they create something new. Uh, if we're talking about commercials, if we're talking about the brand, how do they talk? Not about the products of Balenciaga um, fashion house. But about all of these advertising and so, what do you think about that? If you have something to say, um, well, I'm curious why Balenciaga is 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 being singled out here. You know, I think there's there has been you know this this trend of you know sportswear entering fashion, and that's that's nothing new. That's been happening for several years now. You know, um, you see that you know the the sports language and attitude, and even de and design for a big part has entered high fashion, right? High, high fashion before it was just all you know couture, you know, very tailored, um, hyper detailed um, kind of thing that emphasized a lot on craft, you know, craftsmanship, right? But now you see that you know everybody does sweatshirts. Everybody does sneakers, right? You know, and the you know the rise, the pop, the popularity of say you know um, off white, you know, as a brand, um, as well. You know, it's all it's all part of that movement, and I see that Balenciaga is also you know part of that big you know big big trend right now, and that 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 trend is very specific to the time that we're in right now. And you see that if you look at Balenciaga stuff today versus Balenciaga say, you know, I don't have to actually go way back. If I just go back to say like early 2000, you know, my God, they look like completely two different companies, right? Really like two completely different companies making completely different things, right? Um, I think that they, they know how to tap into um, the youth culture, you know, and sportswear has always been, you know, driven by youth culture. I mean, you wouldn't see like a 50 year old you know, advertising for Adidas, right? You always see as youth, right? So Balenciaga knows how to reflect, you know, the youth culture uh, really well. And so are many other brands, you know, like you see that Dior also has been trying to, you know, um, make their design feel a lot younger and a lot more transient, you know, that things changes a lot, you know, with big type, um, big logo, <clears throat> on everything, on the strap, you know, on the handbags, you know, Balenciaga, you see that uh, sans serif, you know, logo type, right? Spilled out on the handbag, like right? really big, you know? So there's that sort of return of the big logo as well, which I think is also part of that sportswear because, you know, sports, sportswear typically plays their logo very large. So to answer your question, I think they know the youth um, generation really well and they know how to work with it. Cool, thank you. We have a bunch of questions. Finally, we have a bunch of questions from the audience. Uh, the first one is from Jana. And what is charging your creative energy? What keeps you doing your job? How are you dealing with burnouts? 
any personal tricks. Mm, interesting. Um, burnout uh, happen, you know, from, from time to time. And I think for me, you know, it's first of all, recognizing that, okay, I, I am burned out, right? Recognizing that and then um, trying to like put time, you know, put some time to, to deal with that, you know, and the way that you deal with that is really personal. For example, you know, if I can just get to say, watch um, a movie, right? You know, a movie every night, that would be nice. Like two hours just away from, you know, um, from the reality, right? Get into a different story. That would be nice, right? Or, you know, uh, reading, uh, reading definitely helps a lot. And again, you know, each book is a universe of its own, right? So it kind of takes you out of your own um, misery or, you know, your own discontent about, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, not, not, I mean, nothing extraordinary, you know, um, simple things. I can see your bookshelves and I can understand that there are a lot of them <laughs> in your life. So yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we have another question. Uh, how do you store, organize, may, maybe catalog pieces of inspiration you see to be able to pull them up when needed, if you do such? Um, I mean, back in, back in you know, um, Back in 2000, I think 2010, 2011, um, I, I spent time on uh, using Pinterest to, uh, to collect, you know, uh, things I, I liked, I, I find inspiring, right? But um, I guess as I, as I grow older, um, I kind of stopped doing that, meaning that, you know, um, I kind of just store things in my head. Yeah, I mean, I don't keep I don't keep like any sort of you know um, organized catalog or record you know be online or offline to um, to collect um, these things. I don't know. I just let them stay in my head. I know it's not a very helpful answer, but yeah, I, don't, I don't clip you know um, inspirations. So you have like um, maybe original anchors in your brain which helps you to bring to pull back. The, the memories. Cool. It, it's a really good skill as well. I think that you yeah. developed that. <laughs> so thank you so much. Uh, okay, the quite interesting question. Who is your opinion leader in design, if you have such? You, you mean opinion leader. Opinion leader in my in my in design. Opinion. Yeah, yo, yo. Hmm. I don't have one. I was sure that you will say that. <laughs> you know, in, in, in graphic design, I think that, you know, um, I think being vocal or, you know, um, or being vocal with writing, for example, is not a common trait in designers. Yeah, we think more visually and we express ourselves um, visually, right? Um, but there are, you know, um, a lot of, you know, I think at Pentagram uh, particularly, there, there are designers who are um, verbally very uh, vocal. They publish, you know, um, books, they write books. For example, you know, Michael Beirut, Beirut my partner um, has published a couple of, you know, books, right, essays. And that's a kind of, you know, um, ongoing project for him. You know, he started uh, writing, um, I, I, I think in the, you know, early 2000, right? And that became a really big part of his practice. And also, and also he, he, he as a person, right? So he continues with that. Um, Adam Miller, my partner also has, you know, um, written pretty extensively, you know, he wrote a book on Bauhaus, which I thought was one of the best books on Bauhaus. He um, published a book on his, um, on his work, right? And his experience with design um, that I thought was a great book. You know, my partner DJ Stout uh, also published a book on, you know, his point of view on, um, again, his practice and editorial design, right? He came from, you know, the magazine um, design world, you know, from back in the day. So, you know, um, I think these designers are hard to find, yeah. But, you know, for those who have actually, you know, uh, 
voice, you know, their experience through writing, through um, lectures. I, I appreciate all of them. Cool, because you are lucky because you have such great colleagues that yeah. they are opinion leaders for all the world. That's why you are one of them. That's why you don't need to go so far. It's really cool. Well, I'm lucky. Yeah, I'm lucky to be surrounded, you know, um, by 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 this very, you know, extraordinary group of people. Um, that's for sure. Cool. We, previous time we talked, uh, we spoke about the structure of the of the pentagram company, and I think that we could skip that. But do you have something? Because this question appeared just right now, uh, because we spoke about your colleagues. How do you communicate between these uh, partners? Do you have some meet meetings when you collaborate, when you talk just with the partners without any teams and some other people? Do you meet as a friend? Do you meet uh, for some dinner or something like that to inspire yeah. people? Yeah, we do all those things that you that you just said. You know, um, we have um, e well. First of all, you know, um, London, London, and New York offices have the most uh, number of partners. You know, in New York we have ten. Um, in London, I think there are I don't know thirteen. You know, now mm -hmm. so um, there are there there are weekly um, meetings, right? And there are also you know dinners. Um, you know, uh, more sort of casual, you know, um, catch ups between, you know, certain partners and um, that's really casual, you know, um, and we also have um, twice a year um, global partners retreat, you know, uh, at which we'll, we will all get together. Um, and previously we will all go somewhere, you know, that's far away enough to have a really, you know, productive, you know, four days to get together, to bond, and to go through, you know, everything regarding, you know, the the practice, right, and the business, and and to look at each other's work, you know, so um, that that is a very special thing to, you know, to to the partnership. But now, you know, with COVID, um, we can only do it over Zoom, and so far we've had Zoom, you know, two Zoom global meetings, um, and yeah, and that's, I mean, we try to do the best, you know, we can, but. Um, it's different from getting together, you know, um, as a group, yeah, in, in real, in real time, in real space, yeah. Do you have the plan to maybe organize some conference with all the partners of Pentagram? It could be really amazing two days conference or something like that. It's really cool. Would you like to see that? Uh, for sure. I guess that if we would ask people in this chat, all of them will put pluses there. So I guess that it should be a plan for the next year. <laughs> okay, I will take a note on that. I will take a note on that, yeah. Projector that's could help you manage that. Projector will manage everything if you would like to do that. So All right. okay, I will take your offer on that. Thank you so much. I have really, I think that it's a really cool question. How to become a partner, a Pentagram partner? How was it with you? Well, I have to say, um, our our partner search is always an ongoing um, ongoing thing, and it's always very very organic. Meaning, there's never a kind of written agenda as to what we should be looking for or who we should be looking for. We don't have this sort of like oh, you know, the whole world is, you know, digital now. Um, we need um, a partner who can do all the digital things, right? You know, that's how a normal, that's how a typical business makes their decisions is to look at market demands. We don't have that. Mm -hmm. So um, the search of the partner depends on a couple of things, right? One is sort of, okay, who kind of, who, who comes to mind? And this is a group effort, right? So we would just, you know, propose um, names and people, right? Designers who we think are doing really great work and we should look at, you know, we should speak to. And we invite them to, um, to, to give a presentation just like on their work, you know, to us and to the whole um, Pentagram office and as a starting point, yeah. 
Um, but then, you know, we would discuss internally, you know, um, how do we feel about the candidate? For example, chemistry. It, chemistry is a very important thing. And also, you know, um, are there any, you know, any complications, right, that comes with a candidate? Some candidate has their own business arrangements already, right? That may be complicated. And we'll get into those more detailed discussions. And how I became a partner um, was part of that sort of very organic, you know, casual search uh, process. So, you know, I was invited to give a talk to, to, to the New York office um, and I did. And that, that talk went really well. Um, and then, you know, um, I was invited uh, to, to, to have dinner with some of the partners one-on-one um, -on -one. and then at the dinner table, it was actually with Paula, you know, um, and at the dinner table, um, Paula, you know, uh, asked me if I would like to join um, as a partner. So that's, that's how it all um, happened. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. You mentioned that chemistry is really, really important and it works the same. I totally agree with you because it, it works the same with our teachers. We look for each of the teachers. We don't have some process like, okay, this is the website and you can do like that. But we are always pay attention to the chemistry and I totally agree with that. Yeah. Uh, we have a few more questions. What do you think about AR, VR technologies? Is it going to be normal in five, ten, ten years? Uh, on your opinion, how brands will, ch uh, will change their visual communication with AR and VR? Well, AR and VR, you know, virtual reality, augmented reality, you know, and also everything in between, you know, such as mixed reality, right? Um, has been, you know, sort of like the holy grail for um, tech companies for at least 30 years. Nobody has cracked it yet. Nobody. There are attempts. Yeah, there, there are things, you know, inventions, really brave, you know, really, um, really courageous inventions um, along the path, right? But nothing has actually excelled yet at the, at the everyday consumer level, right? For industrial use, sure, there, there are devices that are out there, but at a consumer level, everyday level, no, that has not been cracked yet. Why? Because the hardware is really, really hard to figure out. I mean, the AR VR thing is a computer basically, right? And you know, you see that now, okay, there's Oculus, right? Oculus is, you can say it's probably the most successful um, VR um, brand, but very few people are using Oculus. Gamers do, yeah, a lot of gamers because you know, they're, they're cool games, right? Um, so hardware is very hard um, and most people just find, find it ridiculous to wear a really clunky thing, right? AR has not been cracked at all. Google Lens made an attempt years ago, right? But then, you know, it was a really light, you know, glass, you know, eyeglass kind of thing. But then, you know, there wasn't a real purpose for, for people to use it. Because it's like, what do I do with it, right? And what do I see, right? So there's the, also the content part that is also as difficult as the hardware, right? So content is soft. Like what is the content that people would need to see and how do they actually see it, which is the hardware. So these two things as a whole makes this very, very difficult picture for AR and VR. And, you know, it, it, it needs some sort of, you know, breakthrough, right? And I know that um, brands, you know, are, are working on this really hard. For example, you know, there has been uh, rumors that Apple has been working on this, you know, um, that they plan to launch um, their version of this uh, something in a couple of years, you know, um, and that that's very interesting to see what kind of breakthrough it is. I mean, what I'm saying is that it needs a breakthrough. Otherwise it will never be, it's not going to be widely adapted, right? If you're talking about like what, like wide adoption, right? Like this, like phone, this is widely adapted, right? And I'm talking about this level of adaptation. Yeah, not like for the several, you know, few people, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, we have another question, which is quite interesting. I find it quite interesting. Maybe you will like it as well. 
what we can do to make the world free from the burden of design thinking and make a new start, which is not governed by just a handful of organizations. And in continuation, the same person texted and gives the designers and non-designers a freedom as well as a pathway to come up with meaningful solutions. Cool. Um, I don't think, you know, getting rid of it is, is, the, is, is the answer because, you know, the thing is born, right? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's like any ideology, right? I mean, it's very hard to get rid of, you know, an ideology design thinking is an ideology is no different from say a kind of religion right um and you can choose whether like your your attitude and your position toward it you can choose to work with it you know to go with that belief system process religion all that or you can choose not to and do your own path right but i think that you know it's a matter of individuals choices right i mean if most of the designers on the planet today um tell me that they would rather uh choose working with design thinking that's be it is what i'm saying right it's just like you know if 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 today america's you know citizens say that oh we endorse you know mobs um and violence right and you know um and lies and paranoia and all that if the majority of the american population says that today be it and that's sort of that's the end of this country right and you have to figure out where you go from there right you can't like say okay you know guys abandon this although you know that this is not what you believe in right but you can actually choose your own attitude on it and uh, live with that. That's my advice. Cool, thank you so much. And let's roll up and just the last question, maybe you can, I don't like all the prediction, but for sure you have some vision uh, on the future of visual communication. Where is it going to and uh, the market of visual communications? What should we expect in the nearest future? Maybe some changes or it will be stable. Yeah, something like that. Well, again, well, I don't have a big vision for this, you know, and I have to say that what I'm, what I'm about to say will probably sound really predictable and boring to you um, is that the communications now happen at rapid, rapid speed, a lot more frequently with, you know, abundant um, overload of information. And that, again, influences the practice a lot. For example, people will ex expect an identity, you know, um, changes once every, I don't know, year or two years. You know what I mean? Things get changed very fast and things get changed very fast, easily, because it's all digital, meaning there's no physical implications right it's not like doing a signage and, or you know doing an, a piece of architecture it's very hard to change so there's that sort of rapid change that i think is something that we need to be very um very sensitive to and have a position on that otherwise we're just kind of lost in this you know very very fast movement of everything right including our you know our work as well you know turn this out you know change that um, you have to kind of have a, have a position on that and um, how you're going to respond to that. Yeah. And also, you know, we, we're normal people too, right? We're not just designers. We're normal people too. We perceive information and we're on, you know, on, on apps, you know, on our phones, on social media all day, all the time, right? And is that, a, you know, a productive thing to do? Is, um, are we really kind of, you know, developing our thinking, you know, with that? That's a question that I think we need to also have a position on. Yeah, yeah. I will quote you. We are not just designers, but we are normal people as well. Thank yeah, we perceive information as well. And we use all those apps as well, right? We use all the different apps. We use Instagram, we use TikTok, whatever, Snapchat, you know, Facebook, right? We're users as well. So it's not that we're just designing for these things, but we use them too. And how do these things affect us? 
as well is something that we need to have a position on. And do we want to actually be influenced that way or not? You know, I don't. Um, so I try to reduce my time um, on those things. And I, I'm very sensitive to the time that I'm spending on things because scrolling is a very intuitive act. And you can just end up scrolling for an hour without even knowing that an hour has passed. So I'm, yeah, I try to yeah, I try to actually be very sensitive to that. If I'm like, you know, if I'm on an app for say more than, you know, five to ten minutes, ten minutes at most, five minutes, I stop. I, I just I just go away. No need for this. Unless I'm doing research. If it's research, oh, let me see like, you know, all the different, uh, I don't know, autonomous cars on Instagram, right? That's different. But then it's just like scrolling, I, I put a time cap on it, yeah. Thank you, yeah. I'm, I'm really glad that Messenger from Facebook, they um, announced the app instead of having like the, uh, the Messenger, like the part of Facebook. And finally, I closed. Uh, yesterday it happened and I, I should open the bottle of champagne. I closed the tab with Facebook and now I don't scroll anymore. I'm so glad that it happened because I need just for conversations, not just for scrolling. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. The last one from the audience, I think that it will be really short. Uh, so the question to Natasha, could you suggest some books that you personally find useful in design work? You already mentioned some of them of, uh, by uh, Pentagram partners, but maybe something else. Um, let me see if I can find some books here. Oh, it will be tough, I, I don't guess. Know. I, mean, I, have, I have a lot of books. I have two here that, hold on. Um, I have two here that I think are uh, very interesting. Um, this book is called How to See. <laughs> by David Sally. David Sally um, is an artist. Um, he, um, he's sort of that, you know, postmodern um, American artist uh, came out of that whole 70s, 80s um, postmodern um, period. And um, this is a really great book on, as the title suggests, how to see. Right. And what's cool is that you see it's not one, two, three, it's one, two, and three. <laughs> you reverse order, but you do read how to see linearly. Isn't that cool? That's really cool. I love this cover design too. I think it's so, so smart. The other book is by this, um, so this, this uh, author, Andre Spicer, is that Spicer? Yes. Um, he is based in England, I believe, and he is a professor who teaches at a business school. Sorry, I can't remember you know, where he teaches. This book is really a documentation and a really humorous, you know, insightful, smart, humorous analysis on all the bullshit language that corporate uses, all right? And if you read this, you will understand how design thinking also came about. Yeah, so the two things are kind of related. Um, so these are the two books that, that I'm reading now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You're, You're a wonderful welcome. person. And thank, uh, thank to all the attendees who joined us and for your questions. We had plenty of them. I had a lot of joy. Thank you for your time. Thank you for this opportunity once again. <laughs> and thank you for a ton of information. Awesome. And take care. Thank you. And I'll get back to talking about our conference. <laughs> Thank awesome. you. Take care, Bye. everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.